In my opinion, the village was fantastic. We were a close-knit group. Everybody knew everybody. We did things together. Christmas, New Year's, on the beach in the summer. I'd walk down to Lions Bay Beach, no shoes, no snacks, nothing. They'd basically just say, okay, we'll see you at dinner time. And uh, my friends and I would go to the marina and drum up some coins to get paw. I can see them now walking the logs and swimming out to the raft and, you know, diving in and climbing out. And The mums would come down with picnic lunches halfway through the day, free and fun, and the whole day walking the logs, swimming. It was like being on a perpetual summer holiday. It was really an amazing place, actually. It was complete freedom, complete freedom, and no worries whatsoever. My father was transferred back to Toronto, and we were returning as a family, and so the usual procedure was that you put the house on the market. My mom and my dad were supposed to sign the papers, and my mom ripped them in half and said, we're not doing this. <laughs> We had some family friends, some local people that were building in West Vancouver, and they needed a place to live, so they moved in right away. We all disliked living in Toronto so much that my father actually went to IBM and asked for a demotion to be moved back to Lions Bay and, and Vancouver. When we returned from Toronto, uh, my dad's mom, my grandma, came with us. She got the room that David and Tom had before we had gone to Toronto. And so that's why they ended up out in the driveway, out in the trailer, which, I mean, to be honest, I think they rather enjoyed. They loved it. Now they showered inside, they ate inside, so I was cooking for them still. They had paper roots, and then they started working at most of the restaurants in Horseshoe Bay. There was a lot of guitar, there was a lot of music, there was also a lot of beer drinking. Our place kind of was a bit of a hub for, for the teenagers to come and hang out because they kind of had their own space outside the house. Thursday nights was Hill Street Blues nights where we would watch on a little black and white TV anybody who was around, anybody who wanted to come in. We'd watch that show mostly drinking tea, but sometimes there might have been some beer, you know, you never know. <laughs> When we moved here in 72, the gate wasn't there at uh, sunset. They just finished the logging operation. The loggers left, left whatever they didn't use behind. And I mean, the amount of debris that was in the creek bed from the logging was quite extensive. Other debris like logs and rocks added to it. And then the water flow came to almost a standstill. We had beautiful weather before. The, the mountains were clear, the sun was shining, and it had snowed. We suddenly had warm air come in, and uh, it was torrential rain. And uh, I think it was because of that torrential rain on top of the snow that it, um, the, a dam must have formed up above, and then it just burst. I thought it was a train. And I wakened, but Mike was still asleep. And then we got hit, but I still didn't think it was a slide. Everything was shaking in the house. An earthquake? We were woken up by our house shaking, and it, we thought it was a thunderstorm. It, and we heard this sort of great roaring noise, and then one after the other, we heard these explosions going down the road as the transformers blew on the power poles. I ran down to the fire hall. The power went out, uh, it, well, it flicked on and off, and so when it flicked back on again, the alarm automatically went off, which is what woke me up. I was woken up, I was cold, I went to close the window, and as I was rolling back into bed, the glass blew in. So I wakened Mike, and he got up, and he went to the front door, but he couldn't get to it and it was, the whole area was full of rock and debris. I took a top sheet from the bed and tied it to a, the banister of the deck and just shimmied down to ground level and ran to a neighbor's. And as we drove along Lions Bay Avenue, 
one of these great um, things of debris went across in front of us. It was probably about 30 feet high and um, maybe a couple of hundred yards long and there were huge boulders the size of small cars. You could see them sort of rolling over on top of this and great chunks of um, wood. And uh, I mean, we just looked in astonishment as this sh uh, went shooting past us. We saw a big, big tree, what appeared to be a tree, a growing upright version right down that creek was a stump that had been left over from logging. We had a rope to sort of hold each other together as we walked across the creek bed, which had been scoured clean. And then we just got to the other side of it, and there was a great rumbling, and another load of debris came barreling down and sort of missed us by, you know, a matter of, you know, a few, one or two minutes. Then I saw somebody on the, what used to be the balcony, it turned out it was Mike, Mike Wade. The basement, normally eight feet or nine feet high, was reduced to about three feet. And Mike said, what's happening? And I said, I don't know. And he said, can I borrow your flashlight? And I went to him and I gave him my flashlight. And now I was in the dark. By this time, the lights had gone out and it was pitch black dark. And I heard my sister screaming and then I kind of remember putting my hands up and, and realizing that whatever was above me was like right there, that there there wasn't space. There wasn't, it wasn't like I was, the room was different and I didn't have space above me. So the outside wall caved and Sheila was there and she was able to move a piece of plaster and open up to the out of doors. And that's where Hardy Gouch pulled her out. And, um, and then Susie somehow crawled across the room full of debris and got out that side as well. All I could hear was my sister screaming and then I didn't hear anything at all and I thought that my sisters had died. Hardy saw the girls and told them, go up our driveway. I really think I must have been in shock because I don't really I don't think I was processing what was going on at all. I knew things were wrong. I knew things were really wrong. And seeing them here in their 90s and confused what is happening and telling me that the house was moved um, was really scary. And I got our little girl up. She was maybe eight then. And uh, we were scared. And then when Pat Wade came up, to sit here, she explained a little bit more that the creek was really out of control. And we were scared, really scared, and praying and hoping for the best. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get up. Like I, I, I tried to orientate myself where I was in my room, and I thought, okay, I'm under the bed, partially my feet are in the closet, why, like why can't I get up? I couldn't figure that out. What we didn't realize was that the house had been shifted 10 feet forward and eight feet sideways, which in the dark, we couldn't tell. So they moved down what was the hallway a little bit. Her bedroom was opposite and we found her. So I went and knocked and said, Shannon, are you hurt? I don't think so. Are you in pain? No. Can you move? No, I can't. Can you move your feet? No, I can't. Can you wiggle your toes? Yes, I can. Does it hurt? I don't think so. I said, okay, tell you what, there was a problem. Uh, we had a, a flood. I know where you are. I'll just go quickly home and get some tools and we'll get you out. Well, when he said, I'll be back, I was like, no, don't go. Like, I, I couldn't figure out why I couldn't help myself, why I couldn't get up myself. I, I didn't understand that. She was jammed in. This was an absolute blessing, I tell you, from the Lord, because she had no room to move inside. She was jammed in, but she could wiggle her toes. There was definitely a chainsaw used to get the original opening. One of the firemen, Gord Prescott, did manage to get his lower half 
down and loosen some boards and move them and tell Shannon, you know, to come. There's room for you to get out now. I had no significant injuries at all, um, nothing at all, but I did have a lot of goose eggs all over my head, but of course, nobody could see that. And that was because she had the presence of mind, thanks to girl guides, to throw herself under the bed and everything came down on top of her, but she would have been killed. She would never have made it out. It was a big relief when she finally was dug out of the rebel and came up here and it was very emotional. Oh, I was super happy to see my mom and my sisters. Of course, I'd already seen my dad and, and you know, in, in after the rescue, but it was, I was super happy to see them. The boy's situation for us was dire but we, we couldn't see anything. We didn't really know if they, for example, uh, got into some little space where they could breathe, you know? I phoned, phoned Hunter, the excavator in, in uh, uh, Squamish, and I said, Rick, we have a problem. Get the heaviest equipment you can get and come to Lions Bay pronto, immediately. I think I thought they'd be safe. I thought we just had to get everybody out. And uh, as people were coming to help, I, I don't recall being frightened. And uh, I truly thought that the problem would be resolved. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that it would end up as it did. six o'clock in the morning the machine came and then they were trying to to dig out the trailer as soon as the sun came up we we all headed out the door um, and we were waiting sort of at the end of the road waiting to see like what had happened what was going on when we started to dig, we were told where the trailer was. And uh, so we started to dig, you know, sort of by the side of the creek. So we're digging through mud to get to the trailer. The trailer was completely covered. There was huge trees, huge rocks, lots of mud. I don't remember being able to see any part of the trailer at all. You see, in a, in a tragedy, you always have some hope. Um, Mike and I were standing at the corner of Isle of View by the park now, and uh, they came to tell us. The feeling when we were all standing together of just sort of very subdued and very, you know, you could feel the heavy. Everything. Everybody just felt numb, like there wasn't lots of screaming or crying or any emotional outbursts. It was just numb. It just felt numb. I turned to Mike and I said, under no circumstances can we let these girls pay in any way or be treated any differently because they survived. And I've heard lots of things about survivors who, you know, just can't bear the burden of surviving and the loss of whomever. And uh, we both felt very strongly about that. You know, it was a pretty high attention getting event. And so uh, there were all kinds of articles in the paper. The reporters were very intrusive. They, you know, there was helicopters and cameras and they were trying to get right in there and in the middle of the rescue, like pulling the bodies out. And, and that just was totally unnecessary. It was a real blow to the village and a lot of people decided that's it. I 
move away. A lot of people left the village, sold their houses, moved away. We were connected as a village before, but after the tragedy, the ones that stayed and witnessed what happened, yes, we became much closer. Following the slide, um, the, there were many hands involved in, first of all, the post-slide uh, period. Certainly our public works was very involved. Um, the provincial government was very involved uh, in the removal of really significantly enormous rocks the size of a car. There was not enough land left to rebuild. And so the provincial government bought the piece of land and we were able to purchase the house in West Vancouver on Madrona. The former mayor, Doug Pollock, and that council did an excellent job of negotiating with the province for the debris uh, basins at Harvey Creek and Alberta Creek and later at Magnesia Creek that was built and new clear span bridges. There must have been about two years where these properties were sitting in abeyance with the provincial government while they built the infrastructure, knew what footprint of land they needed. And then they were about to put these properties up for sale. I negotiated with the, um, the ministry on behalf of Lions Bay to have the land deeded to Lions Bay as parkland in perpetuity. And what I had said to them is that it would become a memorial park and they found this very suitable. The memorial park was established on the 16th of June of 1996. For me, it was a, such a lovely, generous, comforting feeling. There's been so many hands on the park. The firemen have placed a bench in honor of the boys there. The sign that welcomes us there was built by former resident Harold Ginger. The mayor of Lions Bay suggested to me that Pat, Wade, and I create a commemorative plaque. If there's a plaque to commemorate the death of David and Tom, that's great because most people don't know. Part of the importance of the plaque is that it actually explains what the park is. It tells the story so that people that have been in the village for shorter periods of time or people that are just coming will understand what happened in that place but also the importance of the community and how wonderful and supportive they are and what, a, what an incredible place Lions Bay is. <laughs>